I recently did a funeral, and every time a pastor does a funeral, he goes to Psalms 23, he reads it, and he says, you know, Uncle Tom was a great guy, and somebody in the back goes, not so much. Um, <laughs> almost all of them, seriously. And then um, I started looking at Psalms 23, and there's so much for us, not just for those moments, but for us. How about if you just close your eyes for a moment and would you just bask in the words of Psalms 23 as I read it to you? The Lord is my shepherd. I will not be in need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for the sake of his name. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Certainly goodness and faithfulness will follow me all the days of my life, and my dwelling will be in the house of the Lord forever. Lord, would you guide us through your word this morning? Would you help the passages that are needed for each individual just to land in their heart, to penetrate and help change our lives for your glory? In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Amen. My first point today is his way for his glory. We're going to just have to grab some highlights of this because you could literally spend six or eight weeks breaking this down. And you have a great pastor. You don't want me for six or eight weeks. Trust me. His way for his glory. He guides me in the paths of righteousness. Do you ever go on a road trip? This is the time for road trips. I've been on a couple and um, the last since the pandemic and people are doing it. Trust me. When you're paying $250 a night for a hotel room in South Dakota, there's a lot of people out driving, trust me. And that's just what it is right now. And so we did a road trip. We went through the the Battle of Little Bighorn. That really messed me up, honestly. I read some books recently on on this subject. And people, if we don't believe that there's some racial issues in our country, I, I don't understand even know what to tell you. But that, that really messed me up, that visit. Um, Mount Rushmore, uh, that really emboldened me because there was uh, a restaurant that had the presidents, all four of them, and a place you could stick your own head. <laughs> I, I put my own there and said, watch out, America. Um, <laughs> went to Wall Drug. I mean, there's signs everywhere in the world for Wall Drug. You got to go there, right? The Badlands. They're ridiculously amazing. Deadwood, you have to go see where Wild Bill was shot. Yellowstone and then back home. What's interesting about a road trip is you can tell a ton of stories because you're on the road and we're actually literally traveling with some of our really good friends who um, we got married on the same day, same hour, different state. Uh, we, have, we were both public school teachers, youth pastors, uh, pastor churches, our denominational uh, overseers, and then our two eldest married each other. And that son now is turning 42 this very day. Happy birthday. Um, I don't know how that happened when I'm only 43. Um, <laughs> so we go on this road trip together. We actually did our 40 year anniversary, we did a cruise to the Mediterranean. Um, and then we do uh, this road trip together. We're, we've just been friends for life. And the crazy thing about a road trip is the path. Now, as we're planning the road trip, nobody has time to even give you input, like return an email, like you want to stay here or there. <laughs> Nothing. We get out on the road, and everybody's like, "How come we're going on highway? Da 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 da. How come we're not going over here?" Well, if you would have done your homework, you could have had an opinion. But now you don't. And I hope you like it because this is as good as it gets. 
Bing Crosby had a song, I Did It My Way. Great tune, really bad idea. Anybody ever do it your way? Proverbs 14, 12 talks about that. It says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Other than that, it'll work out great. <laughs> There's a path that the Lord has chosen for you, and there's paths that the shepherd wants to take the sheep on. Now, what's crazy about sheep, and we are sheep, and my wife's critique for my message last night was, you didn't tell them sheep were dumb. Who she says, uh, her sends her greetings, by the way, but she's teaching her preschool, uh, Sunday school class this morning, and they are way more important. <laughs> Trust me. Anyone like routine? I've got a great one right now. The pandemic really messed up my routine, but now I have a good one wired. It includes a hoodie, sweats, my office, sometimes calls, but right there, boom, I'm in it. Sheep love to go down the same path to the point of destruction of the ground. They will literally wear the path out that they walk to where nothing will grow. And they don't want to move off of the path. But the shepherd's job is to what? To lead you and to guide you into still waters, into, into great pastures. And yet, we want to stay on the place that we want. No, I like it here. It's dead here. But I like it here. Everybody likes change, right? Right? We painted our house a couple days ago. I used to be a painter. At 64, sorry, I don't do that anymore. My wife and I had one deal, and, and she loves to change everything. She would be, um, she is Helen Keller's worst nightmare. I mean, she just loves to rearrange everything, and she'd walk around. You, you, and, and whenever she does things like this, um, she says, do you like it? My answer is always no, but give me a week. In a week, it'll be normal. We like things the way we like them, don't we? We like church the way we like it. We like Pastor Steve. Who is this new guy? It's not the same. Nothing is the same. In fact, there's green grass over here if you'll leave off of your dead spot. Spurgeon said this, the Christian is not obedient to some commandments and neglectful of others. He does not pick and choose, but yields to all. Observe that the plural is used, the paths of righteousness. Whatever God may give you, us to do, we would do it, led by his love. He guides. Am I willing to be a follower or am I saying, Lord, bless me as I go. Bless me, Lord, I'm going. Bless me. Catch up, Lord. Or are we saying, I am following? Because oftentimes, we're just asking the Lord to bless whatever we're about. And he's saying, yeah, well, that's really nice, but I've called you here. Come off of your path. I have paths. His glory. My second point is walking through tough times. Anybody walk through tough times the last couple of years? A lot of fun, hasn't it been? Love a lockdown. My word. Even though I walk through the valley of death. Now your death can be physical or it can be figurative. There's a lot of deaths in this life, isn't there? There's fall as plants start to die. There's also literal death. The only thing that's undefeated is not our Seahawks. It's mother time, father time, whoever he is. We're all going to meet the Lord. And yet it's what we fear more than anything, what we run from. All of us would choose a mountaintop experience. And on this road trip, I mean, we're going up over all these mountains. Everybody wants to live on a mountaintop, but why, hasn't we, why haven't we built houses on top of them? It's not a great place to live, that's why. You go down the valley, and what do you find? You find farms and water and crops. And we're always like, Lord, get me out of the valley. This is death. I want to be up on the mountaintop. 
We just want to live up there. You don't live on a mountaintop. You only grow in valleys. So if it was up to us, we would just jump. Lord, take me from this mountaintop to that mountaintop. To, let's skip all the valleys. How many of your character is important? And character is the most important thing that you own. It's so important. Who are you when no one's looking? That's what's important. And you only learn that in a valley. We want to live in utopia. Utopia doesn't exist. While we're on this road trip, actually in the Badlands, my wife and I were having a debate. I think it was actually, I said it was a big horned goat uh, last night, and she said it was actually a ram, like the Los Angeles Rams kind of ram. And uh, this ram was on top of this rock face. I mean, literally rock face. All of the tours were stopping, going to look at this ram. And the ram's just looking at you like, what do you want? What are you going to do? Like, okay, I'm unique to you. But I don't live here. And as soon as you guys go away, when the sun comes, I'm going to go down and eat. One of my most impactful books is a book called A Grace Disguised by a guy named Jerry Sitzer, Sitzer, who lost his mother, his wife, and his daughter in one automobile accident that he was in as well. And he wrote a book on grief, not like a, this is how to, but just the fact that it happens. And he says, the quickest way for anyone to reach the sun and the light of day is not to run west, chasing after the setting sun, but to head east, plunging into the darkness until one comes to the sunrise. But most of us, when we get in that valley, when we get into that darkness, we we'll go like, let me out of here. And what we want to do what? We want to turn around and go back to the familiar. We want to turn around and get out of here. And Jerry Sitzer says, no, just keep going because pretty soon the sun's going to come up. Anybody in a spot like that where, man, there's no sun, keep going. You're going to come to the place where the sun's going to rise. Don't just stay there. Don't just pitch a fit. God never promised you a safe journey. He promised you a safe arrival. I will never leave you nor forsake you. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 says, O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? It's through the pain that we go through. The shepherd stays with the sheep, even in the dangerous and the hard situations. I can make it through where he leads because we're able to stand with him without fear, which is my next point, no fear. I will fear no evil because you are with me. The shepherd literally doesn't even put a gate on the pen that he builds because he is the gate. He literally lays right there and gives peace to the sheep knowing that he is there. They don't have to be afraid because he's right there for them. I just listened to the one that's turning 42 speak this last week at our other son's church this last week. And he, one of the message points that he said was, our culture is shaken. But it needs, we don't need to be shaken. We need to be stirred. Are you shaken right now about what's going on around you? About what's going on in the world? About what's going on? in politics or socially or are you shaken don't get shaken get stirred up about what God is doing get stirred because God wants to do a new thing and so often we're so busy looking back at the old things that we miss what it is that he wants to do we don't need to be shaken by politics or by a pandemic by a di diagnosis we don't need to be shaken by your children and their decisions right now. We have a million reasons to be shaken. But don't be shaken. Be stirred for who God is and what he wants to do in your life. So right now I'm journeying with a friend. We've been friends um, since I was a youth pastor at Eastside Foursquare. We took our fire choir through Canada and we stayed at his house. And we've been friends for like probably 30 years. 
His wife stood up on a Saturday, said, help me, I'm falling. And he, he grabbed her and three months later, she'd pass of a brain, a brain cancer. Six months later now, she's been gone and he's, uh, I, I'm talking to him weekly now, probably every other week. And he's like, just shakes his head sometimes and he says, Christians are so Splenda Christian. I'm like, what's a Splenda Christian? I know what a sweet and low is. But um, maybe Truvia, I don't know. Splendid Christians are people that think everything is happy. That everything is good. That God, everything is amazing. That God's just going to sprinkle a little sugar on it and everything will be great. He goes, I lost my wife. It's terrible. People don't know what to say, so they say silly things. If you're around someone that's passed, that's left behind, just say, I'm sorry. Is there anything I can do for you? Don't try to fix it with your pithy little words. He's like, why is it we think God's our sugar daddy? It's a false theology. Difficult things happen, don't they? I mean, have you been able to escape them your entire life? I don't think so. Difficulties are part of Christianity. And some people just think that's, that's a false thing, that God wants everything to be great. Best life ever. Everything's great. Everything's heavy. Hey, great. No. Sometimes things are difficult. But we have a God that will never leave us or forsake us. We don't need to fear because God is with us. And grief is not about being shaken, by the way. Grief is about acknowledging pain and loss. Grief is walking through the loss. Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting isn't with the person that died. They're off into heaven. Do you think they're bummed out? I think they're probably okay. I think they would have liked to stick around a little longer oftentimes. But I think eternity would probably help them to be okay. It's the rest of us that struggle. We don't like change. We don't like pastoral transitions. We don't like when our kids leave school. I remember ugly crying when I took the now 42-year-old to Bible college. I, I hugged him to goodbye as I was getting ready to drive out of the parking lot, and I did one of those <laughs> cries. It was awful. It was like ugly cry. And it's like, my dad's like losing it. I go like, hey, I'm not sad for you. I'm sad for me. I love this season of life, and now I'm going to go home, and eventually the nest will be empty, and your mom will buy. No, never mind. First John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love dries out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made, in, made perfect in love. What do we fear? Well, the sins of youth are really, it's really interesting. I've been thinking about this, uh, and I heard someone speak on it recently. The sins of youth have to do with the, the big ones, you know, like, Lust of the flesh and pride of life and stealing and adultery and murder. And old people, I don't know why I think about old people, because I'm surely not one. But hitting 64, all of a sudden, I'm like, the sins of old people, you know what it is? It's fear. My wife goes to the mall and I'm like, huh? I'm going to go broke. <laughs> She's actually really good. But that's what I think. Inside of me, fear wells up, but like, I might not have enough. Fear of broken relationships, fear of loss of health, fear of loss of significance. Gordon MacDonald, in a podcast called The View from 80, said, becoming insignificant to the point of death. Anybody been at the top of your career and then all of a sudden step aside and you become yesterday's ham like that? And pretty soon... It's the point of death. Are we okay with that or are we only okay at the top of the mountain? Because I'm having to learn to be okay with that. I've been to the mountain. It's not all it's cracked up to be. It's a lot of pressure. They said, you want off the mountain? I said, yes. I'll be good. I'll do what I would like to do on my time. And I'll help a lot of people and I won't have to work in a bureaucracy. 
The loss of a spouse, it's a real fear. Loss of life, loss of control. John 16, 33 says, These things I've spoken to you that you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The tools of the shepherd are the rod and the staff. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod is literally something to whack the enemy. It's like this club that's ridiculously hard and strong. And the sheep know that that the shepherd has their back. He's going to take care of them because he's carrying this stick. And if somebody comes after him, they're going to get it. And they also have the staff, which literally is, that's the hook that you see in all of these like shepherd um, Christmas cards and that sort of thing. It's literally so that when they get stuck, that's us sheep, when we get stuck in the ditch, in a briar patch, and so, that the shepherd can grab us by the neck and yank us back onto the path. It keeps us from getting killed. I want to finish with this. It's going to take a while, so don't, don't pack up. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That is so counterintuitive, isn't it? A table with enemies. Right in the middle of enemies, we have this table being prepared for us so that we can sit down in this battle and have a meal. I don't know about you, but am I, when I'm in a battle and I'm running low on fuel, it's an MRE or Taco Bell. Taco Bell is where you can get the quick, and I, I know what place in Oregon. This last week I had to drive five hours. I finished an event that I was at, and at 7 o'clock I have to drive home. Taco Bell and a cup of coffee, 25 minutes later. If you need a job, I know where a Taco Bell is hiring. We can't get employees. It's hard to be mad at them when they're doing everything they can. You can't get employees right now. People don't want to go to work. When you're in a battle, you just grab something on the run, don't you? When you're in a battle, do you sit down at a beautiful table and just enjoy a meal with your friends and family? I don't think that's a normal thought. In fact... A table is a not a normal thought in our culture. Most of us do grab and go all the time. And we wear it as a badge of like, well, I'm just so busy because I'm so important. Yeah. And your kids don't know who you are. Because if you want to invest in your family, you want them to know what your values are, It happens around the table. It doesn't happen when you're lecturing them. You ever give your kid a good lecture? Oh, yeah. Where are their eyes? Rolled into the back of their head. (laughs) They don't hear a word you're saying. But when you sit at the table and you have a conversation about life and you listen to their life, Amazing things happen. You can hear their journey. You can hear their story. You can build a relationship. It's easy to have a kid. It's hard to have a relationship. And then they grow up, and they're smarter than you. They're better than you. That's where I am. I'm good with that. But there's still things that I think they could learn. And they don't learn them from a lecture. They don't learn them from me saying, son, there's just something I've been wanting to tell you. They learn it around the table. You strengthen those relationships. You enjoy each other. It shapes us. It defines us. It determines your destiny. The table does. And here we have a shepherd saying, there's this table. And literally the table is like a mountaintop plateau where the shepherd goes and pulls the briars and the weeds so that they don't eat what's poisonous before the sheep get there. That's his care for them. 
And so we're invited to this great feast with the shepherd who loves us enough to care and make sure that there's no bad stuff that we're eating. In the middle of our enemies. Any enemies out there? The church is consumed with enemies right now. Why? Have you not read the end of the book? Why? You realize that whether you watch the left or the right, all they want you to do is be afraid. That's all they want. Because then you'll tune back in to find out what else awful is happening. Seriously? In the middle of the enemies, in the middle of the war, in the middle of the battle, I have a table of peace. I can sit with my Savior. I can sit with the good shepherd. Or I can flip on the news and go, oh, oh no, another horrible thing has happened. I'm not saying we shouldn't care. Well, maybe a little bit. <laughs> my cup, my cup overflows. Do you realize that I shouldn't be here? My mom literally went to work for Planned Parenthood because she had me. My cup overflows. My wife and I, we're first generation Christians. We don't know anything about raising children in God's way. We didn't do the family altar right. We didn't have family devotions. We let them go to school dances, public school. I mean, we were like horrible. <laughs> All the bad things that good Christians do. We let them, we did the opposite. One, because I ran a Christian school for a while and didn't see that produce in life. <laughs> we have three children in ministry. I don't know how. Because my cup is overflowing, that's how. Because they chose Jesus. If your kids choose Jesus, you look like a great parent. <laughs> Get them in places where they might choose Jesus. Pray for them and don't shove it down their throat because anything like that, they just, they're out. It's thinking about what great things God has done in your life. I'm so far above. I'm like, I'm a C student from Ephrata, Washington. This shouldn't even be here. What God's done in my life, it's crazy. What he's done in your life, if you'll stop and think about it, it's crazy. Because gratitude is the attitude that sets the altitude for your life. Or you can let it live in fear. It's great to have great family meals. It's great to sit at the table with the Lord. But what the table represents to me more than anything is peace. Peace in the midst of the storm. You're in a storm. If you're not, you're going to be. There's mountains and then there's a valley. There's mountains and there's a valley. In the middle of both, there's the table of the Lord. He's for you. He's not against you. He doesn't want you to be running around freaked out at the state of whatever, I want you to be at the table with him. So what do we do? One, I say get after his will. Get after it. Don't just go out about life, about your own thing. Get after his will for your life. What is his will? I was able to say no to Foursquare for this next season of life because I'd spent six weeks on a sabbatical saying, Jesus, what do you want me to do? I came up with a list of things he wanted me to do and things that he didn't want me to do. And when they called about this next season, they offered me all the things that he didn't want me to do. <laughs> That's a no-brainer. They go, come on, really? I'm like, you don't understand. I know what I'm supposed to do. That doesn't, I could serve you, but this is what I'm supposed to do. You want me to do that. It's not right or wrong unless you're following after the Lord. And I want to follow the Lord. I want to be obedient. So boom, cut the pay strings. Fear of loss. Fear of financial ruin. Fear. No. 
gratefulness because of what he's done. I don't deserve where I am. I'm so blessed. It's ridiculous. And so are you. You just don't think about it. He's got you. Even in the valley of death. Whether it's figurative or literal. Because we're all going to pass. None of us get a free ride. Enoch. Okay, there's one. <laughs> you have nothing to fear. Nothing. Why? You have a good shepherd. He's after you. He's got you. On the table. Come. Come have a seat. He's waiting for you. Heavenly Father, thanks for setting a great table for us. Thanks for being a great God. Help us to remember how important you are, how grateful we can be, how amazing our lives have been, even in the difficult times. Let your peace reign in every individual's in every individual situation. Lord, those that are up against it right now, they're in a deep, dark valley. The shadow of death is upon them, be it physical or literal. Lord, may they know that you are right there with them. Whether they're facing insignificance, Lord, you see them as significance because you created them. You know every head, every hair that is on their head. That's how significant they are. Bless these people. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>